these animals stand for bad luck. God's love extends to all creation, including the animal kingdom. But within the Christian faith, certain creatures hold a special, almost sacred significance. While God's grace is boundless, he also uses symbolic animals to warn us of impending trials, delivering justice in ways we might not expect. Think of the goat, the serpent, the pig, the crocodile. These creatures aren't just animals, they're messengers of unsettling truths. What secrets do they whisper? What warnings do they carry? Join us as we unravel the mysteries surrounding these animals and their profound stories within the Bible. Stay tuned until the end, because these creatures might reveal unforeseen challenges lurking in your life. By understanding their symbolism, you can navigate these trials with grace. If you find this content helpful, please like, comment, and subscribe to support our mission of enriching the Christian community with meaningful content. Share this video with your loved ones so they too can benefit from these ancient insights. The Bible records the appearance of over 130 different animal species from the very beginning of creation. Alongside humanity, God completed his grand creation on the sixth day, bringing forth not only the earth and plants, but also animals and humans, male and female sharing a common destiny. One key difference lies in humans being higher beings, endowed with thought, knowledge, and the ability to perceive their surroundings, unlike animals. Yet ultimately, there's no discrimination in God's love for any creature. Every living being on earth has a unique, sacred mission therefore, whether they are good or bad as God's children, it's crucial to respect and coexist peacefully with all living creatures, just as God loves us. As we know, the Bible features many animal symbols with positive, auspicious meanings, like goats, donkeys, eagles, fish, and more. However, alongside these, God also subtly designates certain animals as harbingers of misfortune, some even associated with demonic imagery. One such creature, a timeless symbol woven into human culture since its inception, is the goat. This animal, forever linked to God's ultimate adversary, Satan, is none other than the goat. Alongside the sheep, the goat has been a familiar creature to Jewish and Christian communities for millennia. Jesus was born in a stable surrounded by goats, sheep, donkeys, and more. In contrast to the sheep, often seen as gentle and submissive, goats are known for their destructive and independent nature. They are strong and associated with fertility and sacrifice. In traditional customs, goats hold spiritual significance and play a special role in biblical rituals and ceremonies, serving as sacrificial offerings, symbolizing repentance, and seeking God's forgiveness. These rituals are valued for their spiritual cleansing and reconciliation with God. For instance, Jews used goat's milk as a ritual purification offering, or people would offer goats to God to symbolize abundance and wealth. Additionally, goats were used in the Bible for food, clothing, and other resources. Leviticus 16 shows us the scapegoat ritual, which is a significant chapter in the Bible detailing the annual Day of Atonement and the unique ritual involving two goats. This passage is rich in theological and historical significance, shedding light on the Israelites' religious practices and beliefs. The ritual symbolizes the transfer of the people's sins onto the head of the scapegoat, which is then sent away into the wilderness. The chapter provides valuable insight into the concept of atonement, the role of sacrifice in ancient Israelite society, and the complex relationship between sin and removal. It is a crucial element in understanding the Old Testament's sacrificial system and the powerful spiritual significance of the Day of Atonement for the Israelites. Despite people relying on goats, they haven't always been viewed kindly. One reason is their frequent use in religious offerings. And the Old Testament first mentions goats as creatures of the devil. For example, Isaiah 13.21 refers to satyrs, or seirim, considered goat demons. Seir is the Hebrew word for male goat, thus, goats became linked to debauchery and even the worship of false gods. But wild animals will lie down there, and their houses will be full of owls, ostriches will live there, and wild goats will dance there. In Isaiah 13, 21. The image of the goat is often emphasized because they symbolize evil, judgment, and sin, as well as their contrasting nature. Matthew 25, 31, 46 is where we clearly see judgment and the separation of sin. This passage clearly shows Jesus separating two types of people, comparing them to sheep and goats, with the righteous being sheep and the unrighteous being goats. This passage illustrates the relationship between those who are condemned or judged for their lack of concern and compassion for others. Another example is in the parable of the sheep and the goats, Matthew 25, 31, 46, where goats symbolize the unrighteous and will be separated from the righteous, whom the sheep symbolize. 
God symbolizes power and fertility, as in the Old Testament, where Jacob separated the healthy and fertile goats from the weak ones, Genesis 30, 32, 43. Another animal is notorious in the Bible, mentioned more than 80 times, and depicted as a hideous creature associated with poison and cunning a serpent or snake. As immoral creatures, snakes are not evil in themselves, but they are convenient metaphors for evil in many passages. The serpent is infamous for one of the most notorious scandals in human history, tied to the first fall of our ancestors, Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field which the Lord God had made Genesis 3.1. In a way, the serpent was used by Satan to deceive Eve and lead her into disobedience. Adam soon followed suit. When God punished the serpent, he cursed it. You are cursed above all livestock and all wild animals. You will crawl on your belly and eat dust all the days of your life, Genesis 3.14. Every time we see a snake slithering without limbs on the ground, we are reminded of the fall of man and the consequences of sin. Here, God speaks to the animal, the instrument of Satan. The animal has no rational mind. The animal has no sense of sin. The animal was simply used by Satan. But God curses the animal anyway, even though the animal is not necessarily a willing and rational partner. The snake knew nothing of the temptation. The snake knew nothing of the sin. And the snake actually knows nothing of the curse, because it cannot personally, rationally grasp it. Since Satan lied to Eve through the serpent, the serpent has been associated with sin. The prophets likened the wicked to those who hatch vipers' eggs, Isaiah 59.5, like a serpent that devours us, and vomits us up, Jeremiah 51.34, and like those who lick the dust like a serpent, Micah 7.17. The poetic books speak of the wicked as having tongues sharper than serpents' vipers' poison is under their lips. Psalm 143, of deceitful men who have poison, like the poison of a viper, like the deaf adder that stops its ear, which will not listen to the voice of charmers, however skillful the enchanter may be Psalm 58, 4, 5, and of wine that ultimately bites like a serpent and its venom like a viper. Proverbs 23, 32. Both Jesus and John the Baptist condemned the hypocrisy of the Pharisees by calling them brood of vipers and vipers, Matthew 3, 7, 12, 34, 23, 33. So why was the snake in particular cursed, even though it was not responsible for its actions? What is the point of punishing the animal when the animal itself doesn't have any awareness? The answer is very simple. Cursing the serpent turned it into a symbol. It turned it into a constant reminder of the degradation of Satan. Satan was really synonymous with the serpent. And the great dragon was thrown down, the serpent of old who is called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. Revelation 12, 9. And he laid hold of the dragon, the serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. Revelation 22, rabbinic legend holds, and it's perhaps an accurate thing, that the serpent before the temptation was an upright creature. Perhaps that is why Revelation also refers to him as a dragon, but now he is altered and cast down onto his belly. And further, God says, dust you will eat. That doesn't mean that dust is the food of a snake. Most snakes eat insects, small rodents and things like that. They don't eat dirt. They just live in it. That's what it means. Dust you will eat not as a food, but as a result of writhing on the ground. If you go back into the Old Testament, licking the dust is a common phrase. And we use that still today. When we say a certain team licked the dust, we mean that they were defeated. And that's exactly what it meant in the Old Testament. It was a symbol of being vanquished. So the serpent crawls on the ground and eats the dust as a constant symbol of a degraded and defeated Satan. The serpent, a symbol of Satan, has slithered around the hearts of men and filled us with its venom. No matter how hard we try, we can't escape its influence. As the wicked King Macbeth discovered, serpents are hard to kill, we have scotched the snake, not killed it. Macbeth, I, I, I... In fact, by the time we get to the book of Revelation, the serpent in the Garden of Eden has become a ferocious dragon who wants to rule the world. After a battle in heaven, the great dragon was thrown down the serpent of old, who is called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him, Revelation 12, 9. We need help in our battle against the serpent of old. Thankfully, God promised us a savior right from the beginning when speaking to the serpent in the Garden of Eden. God said, I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring he shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel, Genesis 3, 15. 
This is the Proto-Evangelium, or first gospel God promised that the woman's offspring would crush the serpent's head of prophecy that the Son of God, born of a virgin, would win the decisive victory over the power of the devil. Jesus said that he came to save us all from the serpent's bite, just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life, John 3, 14, 15 cf. Numbers 21, 6, 9. Jesus is the one who crushes our serpent. He is the one who slays our dragon. And one day when he establishes his kingdom on this earth, all creation will be restored to its original harmless state, even the serpent. The wolf will live with the lamb, the leopard will lie down with the goat, the calf and the young lion and the fatling together, and a little child will lead them. The cow will feed with the bear, their young will lie down together. And the lion will eat straw like the ox. The nursing child will play near the hole of the cobra and the weaned child will put its hand into the viper's nest. They will not hurt or destroy on all my holy mountain, for the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Isaiah 11, 8, 9. Next we have the kind of animal considered unclean in the Bible, and also seen in everyday life as a symbol of gluttony, greed, laziness, bad temper, lowliness, filthiness, eating and scavenging all the dirtiest things pigs. The book of Leviticus, one of the five books of Moses, mentions pigs when writing about the laws of purity. According to it, God instructed Moses and Aaron to teach the Israelites that they could only eat the meat of clean animals, while they were not allowed to eat or even touch the meat of unclean animals to maintain their purity. Clean animals must meet two conditions they must have cloven hooves and chew the cud, such as cattle and oxen. Any animal that only meets one of these conditions is considered unclean, such as camels and rabbits which chew the cud but do not have cloven hooves, see Leviticus 11.1.6. Conversely, the pig, though it has cloven hooves and is even toed, does not chew the cud it is unclean to you. You shall not eat their meat, and you shall not touch their carcasses, they are unclean to you, Leviticus 11.7.8. The Israelites always faithfully followed this law, even during difficult times when foreign kings occupied them. King Antiochus seized all the sacred objects in the Jerusalem temple, plundering the temple to make it a place of worship for the Olympian god Zeus. During the worship ceremonies, the Israelites were forced to eat pork. One of the most important religious scholars of Israel was Eleazar, who was 90 years old but still very strong. He was forced to open his mouth to have pork stuffed into it, but he chose a noble death over a shameful life. He spat the pork out of his mouth and willingly went to his execution. The people who were hosting the feast to honor the god knowing Eleazar well, pulled him aside and advised him to eat another piece of meat that wasn't pork, pretending to eat pork as ordered by the king. This way he could escape death. But he replied to them at our age, pretense is not fitting. It would be a bad example for the young, who would say that Eleazar, at the age of 90, followed the Gentiles and ate pork, and they would be misled because I pretended. He was executed. As he was dying, he groaned and whispered the Lord knows all things. And he knows that even though I could have escaped death, I willingly endured these tortures of the body, but my soul is joyful because I have kept the Lord's law. He passed away. His death was a shining example of nobility, not only for the youth, but also for most of the nation. See 2 Maccabees 6, 18, 31. Under the rule of foreign powers, the Israelites were forced to participate in the ceremonies of the gods. In addition to the main festivals, every month on the king's birthday, they had to endure the bitter experience of being forced to attend feasts to pray for the king's well-being. At one such feast, a family of eight mothers and children stood out among the Israelites who were forced to attend. King Antiochus ordered them to be beaten with ox sinews and forced to eat pork, which was forbidden by the law of Moses. The eldest son spoke on behalf of the family. We would rather die than violate the law of our ancestors. He was then dismembered and executed by being roasted in a large, heated cauldron. The second son, thinking that his brother's tragic death would make him obey the king, was expected to eat pork. But he also firmly replied, no thus, he was also executed in the same way. Then the third, fourth, fifth, and sixth sons, in turn, were also tortured to death for refusing to eat pork. As for the youngest son, the king promised him many riches and titles, offering him a life of luxury and a continuation of his lineage if he ate pork. He refused. The king then spent a lot of time trying to persuade the mother to convince her only remaining son to obey the king so that she and her son could live in wealth and glory. Even though she had witnessed the tragic deaths of her six sons, she obeyed and tried to persuade her son. She used the words of her ancestors to encourage him, 
urging him to be brave and follow the example of his brothers by keeping the Lord's law. King Antiochus was furious and bitter at being insulted by the youngest son, so he punished him even more cruelly than the others. Finally, the mother, who was brave and fearless, was also executed. The story of the feast to honor the god, where eight mothers and children were tortured to death for refusing to eat pork, is recorded in the Old Testament, the Book of Maccabees, the second book, the entire seventh chapter. The New Testament also presents the same idea that foolish people have minds like pigs and often scorn the wise guidance of pearls of wisdom. The Gospel of Matthew writes, do not throw your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under their feet and turn and tear you to pieces MT 7-6. As we know, for the Israelites, pigs were unclean animals, forbidden to eat, so it is certain that no one raised pigs. Some herds grew to thousands of animals. This is recorded in the Gospels. In the Synoptic Gospels, all three authors, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, recount the story of the herd of pigs and the demon-possessed man, although there are some slight differences. Matthew mentions two men possessed by unclean spirits in Gadara, while Mark and Luke tell of one man possessed by demons in the land of Gerasa. This demon-possessed man came out of the tombs to meet Jesus. Jesus drove out the demons. The demons asked Jesus to send them into the herd of pigs. According to St. Matthew, there was a herd of many pigs grazing some distance away. The demons begged Jesus, saying, If you cast us out, send us into the herd of pigs, he said to them, Go. They came out and entered the herd of pigs, and behold, the whole herd rushed down the steep slope into the sea and died in the water MT 8 30 32. St. Luke also said that the herd was quite large, Luke 8 32, while St. Mark gave the exact number of pigs, the whole herd was about 2,000. The herders ran away and spread the news in the city and the countryside MK 5 13, 14. The Palestinian swineherds in Jesus' time were probably poorer and dirtier than the shepherds they were of the lowest class, the outcasts in society. The story of the prodigal son, as told by St. Luke, proves this. A young man from a rich family asked his father to divide his inheritance. Then he took the money and formed gangs, spent it lavishly, and indulged in debauchery. When the money ran out, his drinking friends all deserted him. There was a famine in that area, and he had to work for a local man whose master ordered him to go to the fields to look after the pigs. He wished he could fill his stomach with the cassava that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him any alms. Luke 15, 15, 16. Only then did he regret and return. His kind father warmly welcomed him and ordered a feast to celebrate. It is not known whether he would continue to do honest work in his father's house afterward or would follow the old ways, foolishly returning to his old folly, as St. Peter warned. The pig, after being washed, finds a ditch to wallow in the mud 2 PT 222. The evidence presented thus far linked to the assumption that if, by chance, someone is called a pig, by another person, this is likely an insult a form of extreme humiliation, meaning the person being insulted is being equated with the negative, low traits that people have attributed to pigs, as mentioned above. Ravens or ravens appear throughout the Bible. Ravens and crows in the Bible symbolize death and destruction, as well as God's judgment and wrath. The Bible often criticizes these birds, especially when they are described as unclean because they feed on carrion. In Western culture, ravens, dark and mysterious, are also often associated with evil and hellish messages. They are used to feed on corpses, which directly evokes images of death and lifeless corpses. Ravens are the first birds mentioned in the book of Genesis. In the story of the Great Flood, after 40 days Noah sent out a raven or crow, or possibly an ancestor of the modern raven to find dry land after the flood. The raven did not return. Therefore Noah assumed that no suitable dry land was found since he knew that ravens could feed on carrion from the sea. After chasing away the ravens, Noah sent out a dove to see if there was dry land. At first, the dove returned. So Noah realized that there was still no suitable land to anchor the ark. A week later, he sent out the dove again, and it returned with a freshly plucked olive branch. So Noah realized that the earth was finally habitable. The symbolism of the raven goes beyond biblical interpretations and into many different cultural interpretations. Some traditions associate ravens with death and darkness, while in others they are revered as creatures of wisdom and prophecy. This diversity reminds us that their meaning is not limited to one perspective but encompasses many different interpretations. 
In the Book of Kings, ravens are described as instruments of God's providence. During a time of drought and famine, Elijah found food from these birds in his time of need. They brought him bread and meat every morning and evening, according to the Bible. This remarkable story illuminates God's providence by showing that even when times seem hopeless, food can come from unexpected sources. Ravens symbolize more than provision and hope they also symbolize transformation. Their black plumage, often associated with darkness, can be seen as a symbol of change and rebirth, just as an egg hatches into a fledgling. The challenges and trials of life can bring about personal growth and transformation for all of us. Although the raven never returned home, its departure marked a new chapter in world history by signaling the end of the destruction caused by the flood, as well as the hope of renewal and new beginnings. The lessons and symbols associated with ravens in the Bible can be directly applied to our daily lives. Like Elijah, we can find comfort in knowing that help can come from unexpected sources. Similarly, with Noah's raven, we can embark on journeys of discovery and exploration, confident that new horizons lie ahead, like the raven symbolizing transformation. We should embrace change as a path to personal growth and renewal. In conclusion, we have identified four animals that have special meanings in the Bible and are said to represent symbols of bad luck in human life. You need to remember that God is a loving and compassionate creator who cares deeply for all of his creation. The Bible does indicate that God has a plan for the restoration and renewal of all things Romans 8, 19, 21, which implies that his redemptive work extends beyond humanity to the entire created order. Therefore, God does not directly curse any specific animals. Although there are instances in the Bible when God punishes or communicates judgment on humans or cities and nations, there is no mention of God cursing specific animals. Instead, the Bible often uses animals as symbols or images to convey deep spiritual and humanistic messages and meanings. As a God lover, it's compulsory to respect and coexist in harmony with the animal world since it's God who gave us love and feelings, and he so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. The sacrifice of Jesus on the cross is the ultimate demonstration of God's love and his desire to reconcile humanity to himself. Through Jesus' death and resurrection, God offers the gift of salvation and eternal life to all who believe in him. This act of sacrificial love shows the depth of God's care and compassion for humanity as he took upon himself the punishment that we deserved. God's love for humanity is not based on our merit or worthiness. It is a divine and unconditional love that seeks to restore our relationship with him. As stated in Romans 5.8, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. God's love is all-encompassing, reaching out to every person, regardless of their past mistakes or shortcomings. Through the sacrifice of Jesus, God offers forgiveness, redemption, and the opportunity for a restored relationship with Him. This act of love serves as a constant reminder of God's desire for our well-being and eternal salvation. It is a testament to the incredible depth of His love for humanity. I hope you will find this content valuable. It is a blessing that you are encouraged to continue engaging with it and sharing it with others. Together we can enlighten and expand our understanding of God's lovers. Please like, share, and leave comments below this video to help us spread the gospel of God. Thank you for being here, and may God bless you.